second renaissance opens with this shot from the Zion archives. The next scene shows Earth in the future. As Morpheus says in The Matrix, this is most likely to be 2099. Humanity basks in its own glory. It's saying, oh, aren't we fantastic? We've invented AI. The narrator says, the machines worked tirelessly to do man's bidding. Now break that down for a second, because humans are kind of mastered robotics, so now they've got all these robot slaves, basically. Is that a machine narrating this to try and get sympathy? Who knows? One robot called B166ER faces destruction by his master. Instead of just accepting it, he refuses to be destroyed. The only way to refuse? By killing his own human. This is what sparks the human versus machine war. B166ER is then ordered to be executed. This starts mass protests all over the world. Human sympathizers and machines mob together to fight against the evil humans. At least that's what the story says. This is what's called the Million Machine March. Eventually, the humans win by defeating all the machines and destroying them, throwing them into pits and garbage fills all over the world. The remaining machines in the world flee to the cradle of civilization in the Middle East to set up their own city called Zero One. Zero One prospered because it was just machines building machines, building machines, building more machines. So AI grew and grew and grew and evolved so much that they were able to basically have an absolutely dominant country within the world. One of the things that Zero One creates is called the Vector Thrust Coil. This is actually the technology that allows the hovercrafts to float in the Matrix films. And of course, this is something that allowed Zero One to prosper even more. The narrator says that humans refuse to cooperate with the fledgling nation and their power is waning. Think about it though, Zero One are kind of dominating the world with all the little bits of tech and machines that are now in every single country in the planet. If they were built in man's own image, surely they would share man's selfishness. They would share man's capitalism. They would share man's desire to be the absolute best at the expense of everyone else. So no, the machines are not completely victims in this. They are trying to absolutely own the stock market, own the entire industry of electronics of the whole world. The humans then put economic sanctions on Zero One. Zero One sends two ambassadors to go to the UN to plead to have the sanctions lifted. And what happens? The humans turn on the ambassadors. So the second renaissance part one ends with the two ambassadors from Zero One being turned on by the UN in a very evil way. Remember though, this is being narrated by what could be a machine. The second renaissance opens with the narrator saying, and man said, let there be light. Now again, a biblical comparison. Humans then need to do something about Zero One, so they detonate nuclear bombs on it, trying to destroy it. But of course, machines being robots without any flesh and muscle completely survive. They aren't affected by the radiation. The narrator says, unlike their former masters with their delicate flesh, the machines are unaffected by the radiation. Now again, it's almost like this narrator, who could be a machine, is trying to big up how awesome machines are and talk down how rubbish humans are. Like they're trying to persuade the viewer that machines are the natural progression of human evolution. Zero One are then forced to respond by sending their own army against the humans. Humans respond to this by trying to block out the machine's power source, that power source being solar energy. So, humans start Operation Darkstorm. This is a plan that basically blots out the entire sky so that the machines and humans can no longer use solar energy. We see visuals of lots of human politicians and soldiers clapping and cheering in happiness, and we just keep seeing these machines being downtrodden and victims and sad. Again, it's playing into this propaganda. It's almost like the entire second renaissance film is propaganda for machines. Alongside the sky being blocked out by nuclear warheads and all these crazy bombs, the humans also advance upon Zero One with their own ground army. Tanks, futuristic lasers, all kinds of things like this, and a giant battle in ensues. Of course, because machines have been building their own machines and perfecting their methods over the past few years, they have incredibly effective fighting robots. We see some clips of the humans being really vicious, talking to the camera saying, kill them all, kill them all, kill them all. So again, it's making the humans seem more evil than they probably actually were. One of the giant robots that the machines use to attack the humans is this device here. Now what does that look like? It looks like the power plant towers with all of the red pods around it, and that's exactly what it is. Remember, at this stage, the solar power has been blocked out, so machines would have already realised that they'd need to get their power from something else. Now this tower here, this tower machine that's walking around with legs, might not be filled with humans, it might be filled with rats, you know, it might be filled with dogs or any other animal, but basically it's the exact same technology 
as what we see in the Matrix movies. The machines are using bioenergy from something else to power themselves. We even see some sentinels in the second renaissance, a precursor to the Matrix of course. The machines absolutely decimate the human race in the war. They've spent so long learning about the human body and how everything works inside a human that they now know they can use human bioelectricity to power themselves. The machines pluck some humans into their red pods and it reflects the true horror. The machines have complete control over everything inside the human brain. Perception of pain, perception of time, perception of happiness, everything. A big grand ambassador from the machines goes to meet the few remaining human leaders to basically say, surrender now or else. Once the humans have signed, this ambassador detonates itself to blow the last few remaining humans up. With the entire human race now plugged into their strange matrix thing, the machines need to come up with a way to basically keep the body running, keep the human biology producing bioelectricity. The way they do this is to keep the mind running in a fantasy world. And just think about the name of this animatrix short story, The Second Renaissance. In real life, the Renaissance was a period of time around the 16th century, when the wider world suddenly became more and more educated. The second renaissance as a title is from the machines saying that we've now dumped the old way of life, the human way of life, and it's the new improved way of life. It's the machine way of life. Therefore, it's almost like this film is propaganda made by the machines. Kid's story opens with a man falling from the sky. We don't know what he's doing, but he's falling down a building and almost getting impaled on a gate. He then wakes up, revealing that it's just a dream. We see him sitting at his computer, typing about the world being real or not real, etc. On his computer screen, he then gets a message from nowhere saying, there is some truth in your fiction and some fiction in your truth. So he feels a bit relieved that he's not alone. Of course, this is all a parallel to Neo. The good thing about Kid's story is it shows what it's like to be another red pill. We're so focused on Neo, of course, in the Matrix trilogy that we don't really see what it's like to be other red pills waking up from the Matrix. Kid's story does exactly that. We see him skateboard to school and put something in his locker. However, when the locker closes, what do we see? A phoenix. A phoenix is an animal that's reborn once it dies. That is exactly what happens to Michael Karl Popper. He eventually dies and wakes up by himself. In class, we see that his phone rings, so the teacher reprimands him, but then it rings again. Michael, completely ignoring the teacher, answers his phone. Neo speaks on the other end, telling him that they're coming for you. He looks out the window and sees agents. Now pause for a moment, what we see here is the same kind of agents that are in The Matrix 1. This is quite important because if you remember The Matrix Reloaded, when it starts, Neo encounters some better, more evolved agents. He even says, hmm, upgrades. It's because you can see they're more strong, they're better fighters. Whereas that hasn't happened yet in Kid's story. In Kid's story, it's still the old style agents that are still in place just after The Matrix 1. One. Kid then runs out of class, gets a skateboard and tries to escape. He hits a dead end but climbs out a window and then goes up the guttering to the roof of the school. On top of the roof he sees some agents and some police. He knows what he must do. He has seen it in his dream after all. So he simply lets go of the railing and drops, falling off the roof of the school. Then we see his funeral. Many people group around and describe how it must have been tough for him not being able to deal with reality. But then we hear Trinity's voice talking about self-substantiation. This is exactly what Michael did. He somehow managed to wake himself up from the Matrix. So then he's there talking to Neo and Trinity and Morpheus by the sounds of things, saying, I knew you'd save me, Neo. Then Neo says the famous phrase, you saved yourself. This is what he says in The Matrix Reloaded as well. Michael somehow woke himself up from the Matrix. Program opens with seeing this character who's called Sis doing a training mission on horseback in some kind of medieval era. She's being attacked by many other horsemen who are firing arrows at her, but she easily defeats them. Another figure appears on horseback saying, Your favourite simulation. This is Duo, and of course his line simulation immediately says to us that this is actually a construct, it's not real life. They spar with each other, but then Duo starts to mention things about the red pill. He starts to mention how maybe she regrets taking the red pill and exiting the Matrix in the first place. He tries to comfort her by saying, oh, it crosses everyone's mind sometimes, but really it makes you suspicious. It makes you go, okay, what's actually happening here? He then drops the bombshell. He says, I'm going back to the Matrix and I want you to come with me. At first she doesn't believe him, but then he says no it's true. He tries to persuade her by saying it's just a matter of time before Zion is wiped out, but she refuses. 
This entire mindset is exactly what the Cypherites are built upon in The Matrix Online. The Matrix Online is the video game that took place after The Matrix Revolutions and continues the story. Within that, there's a group of people called the Cypherites who are trying to get people plugged back into The Matrix, which means that Duo is not alone. Duo is one of many people who agree with this, but still, Sis refuses. They continue to fight, but it's getting a lot more serious. Eventually, Sis speaks to the operator saying, you've got to get me out. He gives her one final plea, saying, come with me, and still, she refuses. Duo tries to attack Sis, but she defends herself and kills him. Suddenly, she wakes up, revealing that the entire thing was in fact a training mission. Duo didn't exist in the first place. So why were they training Sis on this? My theory is that this story, program, takes place after The Matrix 1. Because in The Matrix 1, we see that Cypher tries to betray everybody and go back into The Matrix. So therefore, all the other hovercraft captains would have gone, oh my god, okay, we need to start training our crew and make sure they don't go back into The Matrix. Sis then gets up from the chair, punches her crewmate and walks off. Wild Record opens with the same narrator as we hear in the second Renaissance. So this is quite interesting because it begs the question, is this another one of these strange like propaganda films that the machines created? We see a world-class runner called Dan in what we assume to be the Olympics in the future. He flashbacks to when he previously attempted this race, but his world record was denounced because of his drugs. Another flashback shows him speaking to his dad, trying to get encouragement to try the race again. He's unsure, but his dad persuades him to go ahead. Then back to the present day, we suddenly see the race start. Dan runs ahead. We see another flashback to him with his trainer, Tom. Tom is trying to persuade Dan not to race. However, the reason that Tom is trying to stop Dan from racing is because of an injury. Tom knows that the only way that Dan can go forward in this race is by basically injuring himself, by pushing himself beyond what a human can physically do. And that is what's key in world record. Remember, the entire concept of the Matrix is basically realizing the world around you is fake and realizing that you can do anything. Morpheus jumps across the road, people dodge bullets, all these things. That is exactly what Dan is doing here. He's kind of recognizing that he needs to push himself past what a human can physically do in order to win this race. Back to present day, we see Dan still running. In fact, he's doing so well that we suddenly see someone else in the stadium, an agent. He is one of a few agents currently in the stadium who have just noticed what Dan is doing. They have seen that Dan is basically breaking the rules of the Matrix, so they have to do something. An important point here is that the entire styling of the agents here is not the man in black style of the Matrix films. This styling of the agents, their outfits, their, their glasses, everything about them, is almost futuristic. So what that says to me is world record takes place in a previous version of the Matrix before Neo. So maybe it's version two or three or four or five, we don't know. The agent touches his earpiece and says, he cannot wake up, do not let him wake up. A close up on Dan's fellow runners reveals that the agents have phased into them. Suddenly now, Dan is being chased by these agents. Everything freeze frames as they start to catch up with him. But then something crazy happens. Dan, knowing that he must break the boundaries of physical possibilities, keeps on running. He pushes himself and pushes himself further, so the agents have to just keep on pushing themselves as well. Then boom, he wakes up in his red pod. Suddenly, he has self-substantiated, just like Michael Karl Popper in Kid's Story. We see Dan floating around in the red pod. A robot zooms up to him, straps him back into his red pod, and electrocutes him. This is his real life body that's being electrocuted here, which relates back to what I was saying earlier about the second renaissance. This shows the true horror of the backstory of the Matrix. The machines can do literally anything they want to every single human body. Then we're back inside the Matrix. Dan stumbles over the finish line. His body's just now a wreck, but he still somehow manages to break the world record. Sometime later, we see him in a hospital in a wheelchair being pushed along by a nurse. This means that what the machines basically did to his real life body has now paralyzed him in the Matrix. An agent appears behind Dan in the corridor. He says his memory of the race was expunged. But then Dan pushes a little further. He keeps pushing and keeps pushing and just manages to stand up, but then immediately falls down again. This is one of the implications about world record is it basically shows how humans will never give up. Beyond opens on the green kind of matrix style screen showing a city. Something zooms into a particular skyscraper in the city and we see people going about their normal lives. Then see a young woman called Yoko. She is looking for her lost cat. One of the local kids actually says to her that they saw the cat go into this strange building. 
in that moment, we see that same green screen from before. It's flashing like an alert. Agents are looking at this building and saying error, because you can see there's an error message. Back in the city, we see a big red truck zooming through traffic. Yoko, wandering into this strange building, sees a few strange glitches, the things I was just talking about. Things like a light bulb flashing on and off despite it being smashed, a dog seemingly turning into black ink, a metal can floating on the ground. That's the thing about Beyond. It asks the question, what would happen if some regular humans encountered glitches within the computer system known as the Matrix? Yoko finds a cat, and then her and the kids play around with all these strange glitches. They jump up and down, basically floating on thin air, pick up objects and see them float as well, all kinds of things like this. They even encounter this corridor that seemingly leads to an endless void. When Yoko sees this void, what's actually happening is she has opened one of the Keymaker's special doors. Remember how the Keymaker has access to all these different doors, some lead to any other door in the entire Matrix? This is a door glitch. The big red truck then turns up at the strange house and agents burst out along with some people in hazmat suits ready to basically fog the entire building. They remove all the kids, including Yoko, from the building. We see a computer screen with the phrase, warning, rendering anomaly at region blah 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 blah. So as I say, it's a glitch, it's an anomaly. There's a problem with the render in this part of the matrix. Interestingly, another point about this screen is it says it takes place on the 2nd of the 2nd, 2003. So this would put this occurrence happening after The Matrix 1, which would totally make sense, because at this point, Neo has woken up from The Matrix, and the amount of anomalies are growing at an exponential rate. So therefore, there would be these little pockets of glitches happening all over the world. Sometime later, Yoko and the kids return to this place where the building was to see the building destroyed. However, they can actually still remember. The agents have not wiped their memory. See, this is an interesting comparison to World Record. In World Record, the agents said that Dan has no memory of the entire race event, whereas here, the agents have not bothered to wipe Yoko's memory. That says to me that World Record takes place in a previous version of The Matrix, just like I said, whereas Beyond takes place in Neo's version. A detective story opens on a very striking black and white train, with a man lighting a cigarette and holding a gun. He says, a case to end all cases. We then see these grand sweeping shots of a cityscape also in black and white. However, some of these things in the shot don't quite add up. We're seeing old style cars with modern style traffic lights. We go into his office and we see old style typewriters and phones with modern style computer screens. Detective Ash stands in his office as his phone rings. He picks it up and hears a voice. The voice says, I have a job for you. The voice says that they're looking for a hacker named Trinity. He's cynical, but when he looks at his bank account and see how much he just got paid, he then accepts the job. We see more of these mismatched moments of old timey tech with new timey tech and old timey landscapes with new timey landscapes. They're called anachronisms. And an anachronism is a mismatch in timing of something. That says to me that this story takes place in a previous version of The Matrix, when the machines hadn't quite perfected their build of The Matrix yet. They're still using black and white, they're still using these strange kind of mismatches in technology. At least that's my theory. Ash continues his search and discovers that previous detectives who have tried to find Trinity have either gone mad or killed themselves or are just missing. Ash encounters one of the detectives who has just written, find the Red Queen in huge letters on the wall. Of course, this is another reference to Alice in Wonderland. Remember how Morpheus references Alice in Wonderland in the Matrix, tumbling down the rabbit hole, as he says? This is another reference to that. So Ash uses this code, Red Queen, and he manages to stumble across Trinity. She offers to meet him on the train. However, this is all done via the same kind of Alice in Wonderland code that he previously used. Ash searches through the train until he encounters a cabin and sees Trinity right there. They both draw a gun on each other. Trinity overpowers him and puts her gun to Ash's eyeball. She engages the trigger and suddenly pulls out a strange metal bug, similar to the one that was inside Neo in The Matrix. Further down the train in a different cabin, we see that the normal pedestrians there suddenly turn into agents. Ash asks Trinity what the hell just happened. She asks him if he's had a dream of being in an eye exam recently. A flashback reveals that yes, he had. This is implying that just like Neo in that interrogation scene of The Matrix, Ash has been bucked. So what's the point in the bucks? Let me explain. An agent is only designed to be as good of a fighter as they need to be. They are still really servants of the architect. They are servants of The Matrix. They are not these all-powerful gods like what Neo is. 
If you want to find out more about this concept of why the agents are designed to be worse than Neo, then please click in the corner right now. Ash then learns that his entire search for Trinity was merely a way for the agents to get to her themselves. The agents approach the carriage and they have a shootout on the train. They're cornered, so Ash sits down and he starts to turn into an agent. Trinity apologises and says, you just didn't make it. She shoots him. Ash says, I wish I could go with you. Trinity says, for what it's worth, I think you could have handled the truth. She then escapes out the window. The agents turn up into Ash's carriage with their guns drawn. He draws his gun on the agents and the film ends. Matriculated opens with this vast shot of the hellscape that is future Earth. We see a woman named Alexa sitting on a rock. She looks out to the sea and says, I see them. Suddenly some robots appear out of the sea and chase her. They run across all the rubble. We're seeing broken down machines, rocks, huge buildings that have been destroyed. This is basically the aftermath of the human machine war. And these two machines are easily catching up to Alexa. This shows the true power of what the machines built in the human versus machine war. One of the machines called Runners drops a small tracking device. This tracking device sends a signal across the earth and we see some sentinels and other robots zooming towards them under the surface. The two runners chase Alexa into a building and encounter another robot. However, this robot has a green light instead of red lights. The two runners are almost confused looking at first, but then they attack. The big robot destroys one of the runners, but then gets destroyed by the other. But it's okay because at this moment, Alexa bursts out with a laser gun. She fires at the remaining runner, who drops to the floor. A crowd of people emerge from the wall and give her a round of applause. Then begins a conversation which is absolutely key to Matriculated, and I would say key to the entire Matrix trilogy. He is trying to persuade her that they need to let the robot make the choice. However, she says, who's to say what the right choice even is? He says that machines are tools, they're meant to be used. She then retorts, saying that the little Matrix world that they're creating for the robots isn't real. See, this is also key because it's basically the entire concept of the Matrix. This is what the machines did to humans. Machines created a fake paradise world and it didn't work. And this doctor is proposing doing exactly that to the machines. We then see a big open room with a few other humans. Alexa says, would you mind? And another human plugs a head plug into the back of her head. The doctor pulls a lever and a huge device drops from the ceiling and plugs into the back of the robot's head. They all join together and wake up inside a construct. This construct is very strange looking, very artificial looking, nothing like the Matrix. Within this construct, the robot wakes up looking just like itself. It looks around and sees all the other human minds, very confused. The robot looks over and sees these two humans and goes to attack them, because of course, that's what it's programmed to do. Lots of strange visuals occur. The implication here is that the robot loses its interpretation of what it thinks it looks like. Its skin kind of melts off and it forms something else. See, what's happening here is it's forming its own RSI. Remember how Morpheus talks about the RSI, the residual self-image? It's how everyone projects themselves inside the Matrix. That's what the robot is doing here. This RSI looks more like a human. The robot encounters another human who's playing a game with a ball, and another human who offers to save him when his entire world starts to turn to black. This black stuff actually came from this little worm thing that the robot removed from his own body. So therefore the robot is saying, oh god, I have created this terrible world, but it's okay because a human is trying to save me. That is key here. The humans are trying to teach the robot that humans are okay. The black stuff fully absorbs the robot and he kind of wakes up on the other side. There he sees Alexa's RSI. Alexa is this glowing orange woman. The robot reaches out to her and Alexa saves him. When they touch hands, the robot experiences extreme joy. You might think to yourself, hold on, the runner is a robot, it can't experience emotion. That is a key theme within the Matrix trilogy. Look at Agent Smith, he gradually learns more and more rage. Look at Ramakandra, he talks about love. This is the same thing. A central theme of the entire Matrix trilogy and matriculated here is how machines can gradually emulate human emotions. The robot and Alexa are now surrounded by a world of colors. Suddenly, the entire simulation ends and they wake up. One of the humans says, Sentinels. We see that Sentinels and other robots are actually attacking the building. The humans try to defend themselves, but the machines are just too vicious. Then the key moment of the entire story happens. The robot can decide to either side with the machines or the humans. He chooses the humans and destroys the attacking machines. He looks to Alexa's semi-conscious body, picks it up and plugs her in to this little construct. He then plugs himself in and they both wake up in the virtual world. Alexa's RSI sees the robot's RSI and screams in horror as she realizes what's happened. She's now trapped in this virtual world with the robot. 
she then seemingly dies right there and then. Next, we see the robot sitting in the exact same place that Alexa was as the film closes. Final Flight of the Osiris opens in a dojo similar to what Morpheus and Neo fought in in The Matrix 1. We see two people, Captain Thaddeus and Jew. They are fighting each other with swords. Suddenly we hear an alarm and they wake up from their simulation. We're now in the hovercraft and we see Thaddeus and Jew walk to the main deck as their crew warn them that sentinels are approaching. This story, Final Flight of the Osiris, is happening after The Matrix 1 and before The Matrix Reloaded. Do you remember in The Matrix Reloaded, when Niobe approaches that meeting underground and presents some photographs of the approaching sentinels? This story tells how Niobe got those photographs in the first place. A group of sentinels then chases the Osiris ship. Thaddeus orders his crew to get to the gun turrets. They avoid the group of sentinels, but then head to the surface to see what exactly their radar was picking up. They see thousands and thousands and thousands of sentinels and a huge drill. See, this is the same drill, obviously, that drills down into Zion in the Matrix Reloaded and the Matrix Revolutions. A wider question to consider here is, does this exact same thing happen in every single reload of the Matrix? Because remember, Zion is almost destroyed every 100 years, then the Matrix is reset. No one knows that, of course, but that's exactly what happens. So it makes you ask, every cycle, is there a new Osiris or is it a different ship? Thaddeus and Jew look at each other. Jew offers to go into the Matrix to pass this message onto a different ship. Thaddeus accepts. They give each other one final kiss and then Jew is plugged into the Matrix. Then begins the chase. The hovercraft tries to escape as the sentinels try to attack them. Meanwhile, Jew is inside the Matrix, trying to leave a message for Niobe. Jew manages to drop her message into the letterbox for Niobe to pick up later. The sentinels overwhelm the Osiris ship and eventually kill the entire crew, including Thaddeus. This, of course, kills Jew in the Matrix as well. Thank you for watching that everybody, if it was a help to you and you really liked learning about the Matrix lore then please subscribe to Jam Punch and I'll be releasing a brand new Matrix Explained video every single week. My name is George, this is Jam Punch and I'll see you next time.